Welcome back to Very Ordinary Differential Equations. In this lecture, we learn about impulse functions. Well, what is an impulse function? Remember the unit step function, which goes from 0 to 1 at the origin. So at t equals 0, it's not continuous, it has a step, and therefore it definitely doesn't have a derivative. But for any value other than 0, to the left of 0, the function is constantly 0. To the right, it's constantly 1. So for any value of t other than 0, the derivative of the unit step function is 0. So while this function does not have a derivative at 0, it can be very useful to pretend that there is a function called delta of t so that the unit step function is this integral of delta of z dz. If such a function were to exist, and if we could apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to it, then for any t other than 0, u prime of t would simply be delta of t. By the fundamental theorem, if I took a derivative of this right-hand side, assuming it all works, I would just get delta of t. So if there is some crazy function delta that satisfies this equation right here, other than at 0, it must be given by u prime, but u prime is 0 other than at 0, so delta of t is 0 everywhere except at 0. So somehow what must happen is that this function delta is 0 everywhere except 0, but now consider any positive epsilon. If I evaluate u of negative number, I get out 0. On the other hand, assuming this formula works, this is the integral from minus infinity to minus epsilon of delta of z. However, if I evaluate u at a positive number, I have 1. That's how the step function works. But according to the formula, I will have this integral right here. So therefore, if I take the difference of these two integrals, I'll have 1 minus 0. Well, that's just 1. But the difference of these two integrals is the integral from minus epsilon to epsilon delta of z dz. So this crazy function delta has to satisfy this equality. For any positive epsilon, no matter how small, the integral from minus epsilon to epsilon must be 1. So this function is 0 everywhere except for 0. But if I integrate on any tiny interval around 0, I get a full unit of area. That's very weird. So we can kind of visualize this function delta as having an infinitely large spike at zero. So even though there is only a single value at which the function is not zero, it is so large at that single value that it accumulates a single unit of area under it. Now on the one hand, this is clearly not a reasonable real valued function like we're used to dealing with. It has an infinitely large value that produces a full unit of area under a single point, that's not how integrals work in our experience. It is possible to formally justify this function through what's called the theory of distributions. It's well beyond our scope, and it's an extremely useful function for modeling certain events, so we're just going to go with it. So we're going to define the function delta of t, the impulse function, to be this function which satisfies some seemingly contradictory things. First of all, this equality is satisfied. The unit step function at t is the integral from minus infinity to t of this impulse function delta. Now on the right, here is u of t. So this must be the integral from minus infinity to t of delta. So what is the graph of delta going to look like? Well, for any negative value of t, u of t would be 0. So the integral from minus infinity to anything negative of delta must be 0. So for any negative value, delta must be 0. But for any positive value, delta must also be 0. Because we know that delta is 0 for any non-zero value, the fundamental theorem of calculus here would tell me that u prime is delta wherever u prime exists, which is everywhere other than 0. But what happens at the origin itself is the function must have this infinitely large single value so that somehow under this single point there is a full unit of area. So the impulse function is zero everywhere except at a single point where there's this enormous value that causes an actual gain of area. 
Now there's another way to define impulse functions and think about them through limits. Specifically, let's let delta sub h of t be piecewise defined. Up to zero, it's zero. Past h, it's zero. But on the interval from zero to h, it takes value one over h. So if h is small, this is a very short interval on which it takes a very large value. Also, what's the integral or area under the entire curve delta of h? Well, ignoring the zeros, we have an interval of length h with height one over h. So the total area is always going to be one. So here is a typical graph of delta sub h. There's a short interval on which it takes a fairly large value. The total area is always one, and now imagine what happens as h approaches zero. Well, the interval gets shorter, but the function gets taller. So as h approaches zero, always maintaining an area of one, here's what the function is sort of doing. What is the limit? Well, as h continues to shrink, the function is zero all the way down to zero, but at zero, it takes on an infinitely large spike in a certain kind of way so that the area was one. Now to represent a forcing function that has a single large jolt at a time other than zero, we just take a shifted version of the impulse function. Now these are very unlike other functions we've worked with. So most of our earlier techniques are very ill-equipped to handle them things like variation of parameters or you know, the method of undetermined coefficients really can't get a lot done. But the Laplace transform is specifically something that smooths out functions, and we'll soon see that the Laplace transform is very well equipped to handle forcing functions, which are impulse functions. So let's figure out what the Laplace transform of an impulse function is. So by the first shifting theorem, we conclude that the Laplace transform of a impulse at time t naught is e to the minus t naught s times the Laplace transform of an impulse function at zero. So let's just compute the Laplace transform of an impulse function at zero. So we have to integrate from zero to infinity e to the minus st delta of t dt. We're going to split the integral into two parts, and this is going to look pretty weird. First, we're going to integrate from zero to zero to account for the single point where the impulse function is infinitely large but with area one. Then we're going to integrate over the rest of the numbers where the impulse function is zero. So specifically, here is the Laplace transform of our base impulse function. We split it up into one integral that has the single value of t where the impulse function is very large, another integral that has values where the impulse function is zero. Okay, so on this tiny, tiny, infinitesimally small interval from zero to zero, we just have e to the minus st being e to the minus zero, in other words, one. So this term can effectively be called a constant on the big air quotes interval from zero to zero. This is just the constant one. However, in this integral, we are specifically working with positive numbers where this impulse function is zero. So in the first integral, this term is a constant one. In the second integral, this term is a constant zero. So with that in mind, this second integral is just zero, and the first one is just the integral of this single large spike of the impulse function, which by definition was one. So overall, the Laplace transform of our base impulse function is the constant one. So what we've determined is that the Laplace transform of our base impulse function is just the constant one. Now by the shifting theorem, for any t naught bigger than or equal to zero, the Laplace transform of an impulse at time t naught is just e to the minus t naught s times one. Now recall earlier we found this result here. This was our second shifting theorem when it came to step functions. So finding the inverse Laplacian of functions involving exponentials generally requires the use of step functions and impulses. If I wanted to take the inverse Laplace transform of an exponential times something I recognize, I'm going to end up with a step function times something I recognize. However, if I just want to take the inverse Laplace transform of an exponential times one, we're going to end up with an impulse function. 
So as a first example, let's compute the Laplace transform of y, where y is 3 times an impulse at time 4 minus an impulse at time 6. This is directly computed using the known result that the Laplace transform of an impulse at time t0 is e to the minus t0 s. Therefore, we pretty much immediately obtain through linearity, we split this up and factor out the 3, and we get 3 times e to the minus 4s minus e to the minus 6s. As a slightly more involved second example, compute an inverse Laplace transform of y, where capital Y of s is s squared e to the minus 2s over s squared plus 1. Now it's more convenient to write this in the following way. s squared is s squared plus 1 minus 1. So break it up as the following two terms, because then this first term I can cancel out the s squared plus 1, leaving behind e to the minus 2s. And the second term I factor out the e to the minus 2s and call it e to the minus 2s, 1 over s squared plus 1. So capital Y of s is an exponential minus an exponential times something that we recognize as the Laplace transform of a sine function. So Taking inverse Laplace transforms of both sides, the first term is just going to be an impulse function, and the second matches our general format for piecewise functions, not for impulse function. So we know that the inverse Laplace transform of y is the inverse Laplace transform of an exponential minus the inverse Laplace transform of an exponential times 1 over s squared plus 1. Now the first just brings us an impulse at time 2. But the second brings us a step function at time 2 times a sine function, which has been shifted by the same amount. Now, what this could represent is something that is constantly zero until time 2, where there is a giant impulse of something, but also the introduction of a sine wave. As a third example, let's compute the Laplace transform of y, where y is this infinite series. i goes from 0 to infinity. At time i, we have an impulse. However, it is scaled by the factor 1 over 2 to the i. So at time 0, there is an impulse. At time 1, there is half an impulse. At time 2, a quarter impulse, and so forth. So there is a sum of a bunch of impulses at integer times, but of exponentially decreasing magnitude. The Laplace transform, however, is not particularly difficult. So if I take the Laplace transform and I bring it inside the sum, the factor 1 over 2 to the i stays there. And we already know that the Laplace transform of an impulse at time i is e to the minus i s. So here we have it. Here's our Laplace transform. So we've represented our Laplace transform as an infinite sum, but we can actually simplify this. Notice that this is just e to the minus s over 2 all raised to the i. This is now a geometric series. So the geometric series going from index 0 to infinity of something to the i is 1 over 1 minus that ratio e to the minus s over 2. Multiplying everything by 2 simplifies this a little bit to 2 over 2 minus e to the minus s. So altogether, what did we discuss? Impulse functions are not exactly well-defined in our usual sense, but it is possible to define them formally, although we don't really go over the details, but they represent something very useful, something that at a singular moment in time has a very large jolt so that the integral actually gains area at one unique point in time. The Laplace transform of such an impulse was actually quite easy to compute in this way. Therefore, it's reasonable to expect that we're going to be able to solve differential equations involving impulse functions in the forcing term. We're actually going to see that problems that have impulse forcing functions will generally produce solutions involving step functions.